I'll just, I'll just get this out of your way. So. No, I know. Oh, thank you. Welcome. Oh. <laughs> now that we're all awake, my name is Jim Cupper. I'm here to welcome you to our second lecture of the season. And just a couple of announcements I'd like to make. For those of you who didn't notice at the sign-in table, there's a sheet that you can sign up for our holiday luncheon, which is coming up on December 13th at noon at the Park Club. It's always a great, fun event. I just had somebody sign up for it and said they'd never been to the Park Club, so it's going to be exciting for them. Uh, coming up also, uh, our next speaker will be Laura De Becker, Interim Chief Curator and the Helmut and Candace Stern Curator of African Art at the University of Michigan. And that'll be on March 13th. So mark your calendars for that. Be sure to be here for that one. Um, and also I wanted to remind you of the KIA's art sale, which is 
Thursday, November 16th, 5 to 8 p.m. is the members' night. And my understanding is there's always a line out the door for that, so be sure to get here early for that. Then it'll be open to the public on Friday, 5 to 8, and Saturday, 9 o'clock in the morning till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So those are some big events coming up. And with that, I'd like to introduce from our program committee, Kat Karacha, who's going to introduce our speaker. Kat? Thanks, Jim. Can I just say, it always makes me happy to see you guys. So thank you for coming out this morning. I think you're really going to enjoy today's speaker. And I'm really delighted to introduce you to Naida Calazo Lorenz. Um, she's an interdisciplinary artist from Puerto Rico. She earned an MFA degree from New York University and a BFA degree from Massachusetts College of Art and Design. Her work has been exhibited at numerous sites, including El Museo del Barrio in New York City, the Mattress Factory in Pittsburgh, Museum of Latin American Art in Long Beach, the Patricia and Philip Frost Art Museum in Miami, Bass Museum of Art in Miami Beach, Urban Institute for Contemporary Arts in Grand Rapids, Museo de Arte Contemporaneo in San Juan, Museo Universitario del Choco in Mexico City, and the Daos Art Museum in New Zealand. She's received grants from the Paula Krasner Foundation, Ulite Arts, and Beta Local, among others, and is a former visiting fellow at the Arca Center for Social Justice Leadership, and her work is featured in Relational Undercurrents, Contemporary Art of the Caribbean Archipelago, published by Duke University Press, um, A to Z of Caribbean Art, published by Robert and Christopher in Trinidad and Tobago, and The Dark Wood, Language Art Anthology, published by Apple Pie in the UK. The latter looks really interesting, so I haven't read it yet, but look it up if you haven't had a chance. Her work has been reviewed in publications including the New York Times, Art News, Artnet, Art Nexus, Hyperlogic, Arte, Del Arte Aldea International, Bomb, and New City. Um, we're really fortunate that she lives and works in Kalamazoo because that's why she's here today, along with the fact that she's just an amazing artist and is, really speaks incredibly about her work. So I'm really pleased to introduce you to Naida Colazo Lorenz. Okay. Is that is that good? Okay. Um, well, first, thank you. Uh, whoops. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for being here but particularly the Art League of, of Kalamazoo. Thanks for the invitation and CAT Project for you know, reaching out and, and organizing this, yeah. So um, let's see, um, you're probably wondering what has been playing um, in the video while you were all coming in. And the work is titled Unclassified and it's, um, it's a video from a couple of years ago. It uses text from a 1952 US government report of UFO sightings uh, in the city of Mayagüez on the western coast of Puerto Rico, uh, which I'm, as Kat mentioned, that's where I'm from. And so what we have of that original report are these photos or scans of what originally was a typed, you know, report that uh, has probably been reproduced many times through either photocopies, even faxes um, over the years. And so they show an accumulation of marks uh, with, you know, the original, well, not original, but redaction marks, handwritten notes, plus folds and creases or stains from the original papers plus the leftover marks of the various technologies used to reproduce th these images. So, so I was interested in that, in that layering, you know, in that layering of time, layering of data. And so what I did was that I took the scanned image of the report and ran it through an OCR software, which is the optical character reader software that can turn an image of text into text that is editable, that we can edit. And so this is the result. I, I was interested in seeing the inaccurate translation that happened. 
um, you know, whether it's missing or swap letters or marks on the page that translated into characters or, or for the most part, punctuation marks. And, you know, I appreciated the parts that were legible as much as the ones that were all scrambled. And, and I wanted to explore the conceptual and poetic possibilities of, of that material. I have to admit, I was less interested in whether this was an actual UFO or, <laughs> <laughs> or if the government was covering it up. Uh, and, and a lot more interested in thinking about what might be uncertain, you know, about uncertainty um, and how uncertainty might be perceived. And so, you know, I, I, I was also thinking about data and coded messages, um, but, but really it, it was something about the shift between text as language and text as image or abstract marks that, that, that I was that provoked me to, to work on this. Um, working with text often allows me to point to some sort of what I like to call a mindscape, you know, a, a mental or emotional space, particularly when the text speaks about sensorial perception. So what you're seeing is a still frame from another text-based animation titled Sightings from 2016. And it consists of a series of phrases just like that centered on the screen that would fade in and out one after the other at a particular rhythm, you know, not too fast, so enough time to read, but, but, but it, they keep pulsing. And I worked solely with found text from sources related to different types of sightings. So yes, there were UFO sightings, but there were other types of sightings, whether those were paranormal sightings, you know, ghosts or other strange phenomena or search and rescue missions, um, wildlife sightings, enemy sightings in the context of war, um, you know, so different kinds of sightings. And, and, you know, I wanted to explore the dislocation that's happening, first of all, between what you're reading supposedly about what you're seeing, but you're not really seeing it. Um, so I was interested in that dislocation, but also by working with a nonlinear narrative, you know, where, where we're constantly shifting. But somehow I was never fully satisfied with this work. <laughs> I, I don't tell anyone. Um, I, I felt that it was a little bit too specific or maybe a bit too literal. And, and, and I didn't want to be that direct. I, I wanted, I was looking for something a bit more poetic or more ethereal. So um, I've been able to take this work further through a collaboration with a music composer. Uh, her name is Ashley Bush from, from here, from Michigan. And we've collaborated in other projects throughout the years. But what we did, it's, it's still a work in progress, but we're working on a five movement operatic performance. Uh, with dozens of musicians and singers and, and multiple animated uh, video screens. And it's all based on the original text of my video sightings. So we took that text and, and have been transforming it into this new work. And so we have the animations and the musical composition close to ready. So the hope is to get funding to actually get to produce the, the performance. So, you know, that we'll see about that. Um, but I will play, I want to play a demo. It, it'll be just like the first minute of the first movement, just so that you get a, a sense of what I mean by wanting to work with something a bit more ethereal, perhaps, or, or more poetic. Come, 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 come
I'll stop it there. I just wanted to give you a short preview. Um, I've produced other works that incorporate found text as well. In this case, the text relates for the most part to the Bermuda Triangle. And most of you may know that the Bermuda Triangle is an area in the Caribbean known for its unsolved mysteries and disappearances of ships and planes. As you can see, San Juan, where I'm from, is one of the corners, uh, one of the points, and that's where I grew up. That's where my family lives. And, you know, since I'm here in the States, it is the space that I traverse, you know, that I have to cross when, when going back home. So I was interested in the space as one that might be simultaneously geographic and psychological and imaginary. And I was interested in how, how, how those could be connected and explored. So for, for some years, I collected text about it, whether those were first person narratives, uh, you know, personal stories or scientific data, weather data, data, um, you know, press releases from, from airline companies. Like I, I, I gathered as much information as I could, as well as other really strange things. <laughs> uh, and so when I was invited to produce a site-specific installation at the Mattress Factory in Pittsburgh, that's the research that I was doing at the time. So I decided to, well, see how I could manipulate the map. So, so I uh, mirrored, you know, clearly I, I unfolded, it's what I'm calling unfolding it, but it's really uh, flipping, mirroring the triangle. And I noticed that I just had to stretch it a, a little bit to get to Pittsburgh. So, so the research extended to include all of that geographic area with particular emphasis on, 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 on the Bermuda Triangle, but specifically Pittsburgh as well. So um, what I wanted was for people to navigate the work like a map. Um, you know, the thing is that they were just seeing bits and pieces, you know, fragments of phrases from the many different stories and, and you know, actual facts and things that happen that can be proven with other very subjective, you know, unproven or invented information. There were also some edited found images or charts that, uh, that I manip manipulated or, or, or probably took away information from that made it seem somewhat scientific. Uh, and, and those were combined with, uh, you know, my abstract drawings and, and photos that I took. So I, I was interested in suggesting a space or perhaps a state of mind you know, that, that is all about uncertainty as, as well, um, or that is somewhat uncertain, hard, hard to pinpoint. And so I ended up producing three different installations, one in Pittsburgh, um, one in New York, and one here in Kalamazoo, which they happen to be the three cities where I've lived for the past 23 years. So it, it's, you know, it ended up being kind of my, my own triangle. Um, this is a detail from the New York one, which that one included also some video components and sound. And, you know, when it came time to research the one uh, for Michigan, I, I focused it on Lake Michigan. I, I learned about the Great Lakes Triangle. Uh, and I did not know that there have been as many mysterious disappearances of ships and planes in the Great Lakes <laughs> uh, as much as in the Bermuda Triangle, which was really good for my research and, and, <laughs> and for this work. Um, and so, you know, this, this third installation was by far the most complex and ambitious one. It was exhibited at the Richmond Center for Visual Arts at Western. Um, and I'm blanking on the year. It may have been 2013, circa. 
2013. Um, it involved the space within a space. So we, we built a room in the, in the middle of the gallery, which allowed for a bit more, a bit more of a labyrinth-like navigation because it created these corridors. And this one also included small found objects. You know, there were vials, like scientific looking vials with different substances and water samples, uh, found metallic fragments, rocks, uh, you know, clearly a fake fish in a liquid solution, glass and metal spheres. There was a bent fork somewhere, um, you know, um, among other smaller objects. And so, you know, I was exploring the collapse between the imaginary and, and the factual. I, I, I felt that it opened up a space for me to explore, sort of a, a space that allowed for new possibilities. Um, and, and, and I feel that's what, how, however this project developed when it got to Michigan, it, it went into its own direction. And, and actually inside the room, there was a four channel video installation with mirrors that created the illusion of an infinite tunnel. So you went into the space, there were two doors where you could enter the space and um, opposite walls had projections and the other two opposite walls had mirrors. The rhythm inside the room was slow, slow paced, both the visuals were these abstracted visuals and sort of abstracted sounds that were reminiscent of underwater sounds and visuals. Um, and, I, and I felt the room offered the viewer a shift in perception, you know, from the more mental and, and, and rational navigation in the outside of the space into this more immersive sensorial space. Um, which, which of course I thought of it as an imaginary tunnel, you know, underwater tunnel that connected the bottom of Lake Michigan to a underwater cave back home um, in, in Puerto Rico. So uh, I, I guess I made it back home in some way. <laughs> um, the top of the room had a drawing that functioned as a graphic image of that tunnel and could only be viewed from the second floor of, of the building through the glass. So, you know, for this, I was interested in continuing to push these different points of view, you know, of, of looking at this subject. Um, you know, this, 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 this idea, this concept uh, of, of the Bermuda Triangle and, and everything else that comes with it. And, and I was interested in the different types of languages, in, including the visual languages. So, um, you know, I felt that I was trying to combine different types of languages in a single installation and, and trying to explore or push those perceptual shifts, you know, for myself and for the audience, for the viewers as well. Navigation and mapping are very much part of my practice. This is a wall installation uh, from the Geo Disconnect series, which started in 2014, but it's still ongoing. And each work consists of 360 framed clippings of maps combined with color paper. And, and, and these are maps that I've been seeking and, collect, and collecting for many years from around the world. They're actual paper maps. Um, the number of units is 360 and it relates to the 360 degrees of, of the globe. And the work deals with the idea that connections and disconnections are things that can happen simultaneously. So in this case, besides the obvious fragmentation of territory and geography, just by cutting the, the maps, I was also exploring the structure of the grid as something that can visually generate connections as well as isolate areas. So there are moments where two very different or, or very distant geographic areas seem to continue across the black line of the borders of the frame um, but then there are also moments where the frame itself or the solid color rectangles um, interrupt that or, 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 you know, divide those, break up those areas. So 
when I came up with the idea of blocking parts of the map, because truly just putting the clippings of the map for me wasn't enough, <laughs> even though there would have been a bit of disconnection. But when I, when I came up with the idea of blocking parts of the map, I was thinking about territories to which we may not have access to uh, for, for whatever reason. And, and I was specifically thinking about the island of Vieques, which is one of the islands in the Puerto Rican archipelago. And for those who may not be aware of it, Puerto Rico is neither a state nor an independent country. It's been a colony or territory of the United States since the Spanish-American War in 1898. And prior to that had been a colony of Spain for about 400 years. So between the 1940s and 2003, the US Navy occupied more than three quarters of the island um, of Vieques and used it as a military training range. So the people of Vieques, the civilians, lived in the remaining one quarter of the island and had no access to the rest of the island or its surrounding waters. Um, I should say that currently the areas that were occupied by the military are designated as a super fund site um, because they are so heavily polluted. You know, they're, they're still on exploded bombs uh, as well as high levels of toxicity. There's, there's, there's napalm, mercury, arsenic, um, you know, depleted uranium, among, among other uh, contaminants. So, you know, th that's what I was thinking about when I was considering blocking part of the maps. But of course, it was also a, a formal choice. You know, the solid rectangles are meant to visually activate the work. They're meant to grab attention and, and also give the work a visual rhythm. Uh, as well. The first installations in the series, just like this one, included mostly geopolitical maps. So, you know, maps with political borders. But in the past few years, I started to use navigational maps, such as nautical charts and, you know, used for ocean navigation or aeronautical charts used by pilots. And although not exclusively, they were focused mostly in the Caribbean region, including Puerto Rico. And, and I also added geologic maps of the moon, you know, like lunar charts. And obviously this time, instead of working with the color rectangles, I worked with circular shapes. And yes, there's a reference to the moon, but also I think I was echoing some of the circular marks that I found to be quite prevalent in the navigational maps. I was also interested in how some of the shapes here, yes, they covered and blocked areas, but others seem to highlight, uh, you know, or, or, or like a spotlight maybe, um, or as if looking through a microscope or a telescope. So, so I was interested in what that circular uh, shape could offer. And of course, by changing the shapes and the types of maps that I was using for the installation, the intention was also to try and generate even more shifts and dislocations uh, than the previous ex installations. So, you know, in this case, I'm using navigational maps, but I'm really rendering navigation impossible or, or you know. <laughs> uh, this is one of the most recent ones in, it's not the most recent one, but close, just from a couple of years ago. And in this case, I continued working with navigational maps, but this time focusing on areas of water, um, you know, like oceans, lakes, and rivers, which is why the color blue dominates the work. There, there's also an emphasis on Puerto Rico and Caribbean region, um, although not exclusively, the Great Lakes are there as, as well as other bodies of water. And this time, besides maps of the moon, I included, I included maps of other planets paying particular attention to topographic areas named after uh, seas or oceans, um, you know, like the Mariborium or the Northern Sea on Mars or the Sea of Tranquility uh, on the moon. I've also produced other works that deal with maps or mapping in different ways, such as these ink drawings on found pages of old atlases. The title of the one on the left is Interference, 
and the one on the right is partial view. There's also the island mapping series. I, I tend to work with very open series that, <laughs> that I continue to work on throughout the years. So this one's another ongoing series, which uh, they're ink and watercolor drawings. And, and they're various sizes. The largest one is probably around, I don't know, um, 20 by 30. The smallest one is about 12 by 20, just to give you a, a, a sense. And to me, they're imaginary islands. And, and in my mind, their marks and shapes represent whether it's geologic patterns or areas of conflict or you know, territorial divisions or, or some imaginary topography. You know, um, this, this, these are definitely a, a, a quite intuitive to me as well as I work on them. I also want to talk about this other project, which relates to mapping and it's site specific. It's a it's a new, somewhat new, uh, work that I completed about a year and a half ago at El Yunque, which is the tropical rainforest in in Puerto Rico. The forest is located about an hour away from San Juan in the northeast part of the island, and it's a relatively small. Uh, forest, less than 30,000 acres. Um, but it's incredibly significant in many ways. It, it's, it's believed to have been a sacred site to the Taino indigenous people of the island. And actually their petroglyphs can be found in boulders along the rivers. It is a magical place of outstanding biodiversity. There are thousands of native trees and plants, many of which are endemic, and quite a few that are exclusively found there. It's also the home to numerous species of animals, many of which are also endemic to Puerto Rico. And I, I took this photo in the dwarf forest uh, ecosystem, which is at about 3,000 feet above sea level. But the thing is that every single plant, every single leaf, uh, in that area is constantly in a state of wetness. <laughs> like everything there is covered by drops of water all year long at that point. Um, El Yunque is part of the US National Forest Service. So the project was commissioned by the US Forest Service for the Forest Visitor Center, which had been damaged by Hurricane Maria in 2017. The artwork was to be installed at the entrance of the theater, serving as a connector or transition space between the outdoors and the outdoor exhibitions and the film about the rainforest that plays inside the theater. The work also had to engage the concept of interconnectedness within the, within the context of the forest. So that's what I was asked to do. And so what I proposed, and you're seeing some of my uh, sketches, proposal sketches, um, was a wall installation with over 500 small panels that would incorporate photographic images combined with the color rectangles, um, not unlike the ones in the Geo Disconnect series that I showed earlier. And I wanted the work to function as an expressive and somewhat abstract mapping of El Yunque. Um, and in thinking about interconnections, this needed to be looked at in the, in the broadest and most inclusive way. So um, my wife and I, she's an artist and assisted in the project. We, we spent about a, a month shooting over 7,000 photos. Um, we, we spent that month on site doing photographic research, which included the many different ecosystems, uh, the communities throughout that, that live in the forest throughout seven different municipalities, uh, cultural and historical sites, scientific and conservation programs, among many other areas of focus. And you're obviously seeing some details from the installation, some of the images. We did not limit our research to the geographic boundaries of the park either. Quite the contrary, we expanded our research in many directions. We followed the roads and the hiking trails, 
um, and the various rivers from the top of the mountains uh, to where they meet the oceans. Uh, we got to talk to people about their communities and their relationship to the forest. Many would point to specific sites, uh, you know, or places that hold special significance to them. And, and they insisted that I go and photograph them to include them in the project. Um, we met with geologists, botanists, archaeologists, and, and many other scientists, and met with activists, volunteers, and community organizers who seek to protect the forest and the right to co-manage it. We got to consider the many layers of history of, of stolen and occupied lands and its site as a space of deep care and, and, and love and resistance. I also got to experience it through my, my own perspective, of course, uh, you know, the, the sights and sound and the many memories that surfaced throughout the process of, you know, my own memories of being in the forest many times throughout my life. And also my, my, my mother's memories who, you know, she used to spend her summers there as a child um, in the rainforest. So she also told me quite a bit of stories. And, and actually the sepia photo on the left is her in the 1930s um, swimming in one of the rivers in, in the forest. So to me, it was important that the work had different types of visual imagery that there were different scales, you know, zoom, zooming in, zooming out, low, high, you know, all different points of views, um, different perspectives. And, and it was essential that it be installed in a non-hierarchical way, you know, which, which is something that I often do with my work. Um, it, it's, meant to, it, it's meant to stimulate subjective navigation and free association. And, you know, I think of it as a map just not one where we're able to locate ourselves or find specific locations, but perhaps where we're invited to just wander. Um, you know, one experience I had as, as I was installing it was that some of the construction workers working on the building uh, came by, they, they, they live around the area, they're local, and they started pointing at details and places and telling me exactly where those were and, and telling me stories about their dad or their, you know, uncles taking them to that place and, and reminiscing, you know, reminiscing about it. So, so that, that to me felt really good because that's kind of what I wanted. I wanted that wondering and also that, um, you know, the, the almost like these bits and pieces of memories and, and sites where they would combine, get combined. So this is another site-specific project that also relates to mapping. The title is Debajo de la Casa, which translates as underneath the house or under the house. And it was produced for an exhibition space located in the basement of a house in Santurce, which is the area in San Juan where I grew up. And I should say that basements are quite rare back home. I only know of one other one. Uh, so, you know, the, this one in particular had been added to the house in the 1940s, about two decades after the house was built. Um, so, so that got me really thinking about what a basement is and, and exploring the basement as a concept, um, you know, as a, as a space that simultaneously connects and disconnects the house from the context, you know, from, from the land. Um, and of course, I guess metaphorically, I was also thinking about it as a space between the one I currently live in 2000 miles away and, and, and my childhood neighborhood, because that was that, you know, that was it. So what you see in the photo is what people encountered as soon as they entered the space. That's the view from the entry from the from the doorway. And it's an anamorphic drawing based on a topographic map of the area which I painted directly on the various walls and columns. It looked complete only from that one spot. As, as soon as you moved, it would break up or get distorted. So um, there was also a column of old books at the farthest corner of the space. Um, they're, they're, 
sort of, I, for the most part, they were published around the time that that house was built, but not exclusively. And the books used to belong to my grandfather, who uh, used to be a scientist and a, and a writer. They extended from floor to ceiling, and that's because I was interested in them as part of the architecture, as an actual column. Um, they were placed with their spines against the wall so that we couldn't see the titles and the authors because that was not what I was interested in. I, I was interested in highlighting the pages and their discoloration, which to me suggested the passing of, of time. And it also made me think of geologic strata as well. And, and the land, the soil that was there before the, base, the basement was ex excavated. This is the view from actually where the books are. Uh, and, and we can see another one of the anamorphic drawings. And so part of the idea in using topographic maps in this way was so that they would surround us as, as you were in, in the space, um, as if we were sort of traversing that map. I, I felt that the many columns and smaller rooms within the space gave it a, a bit of a labyrinth vibe as well. And I wanted people to explore the space and, and spend some time with it uh, and continue to find things like the small video of the flickering light bulb that was playing in the corner or the ceiling, which was covered with a white charcoal drawing that mirrored the pattern of the floor tile that was right above the basement on the first floor of the house. And so, you know, what I did was I, I created a laser cut stencil on plexiglass, which then I used to draw the pattern. Um, but these are the original hand painted and locally produced hydraulic tiles from the 1920s, which in their many different colors and patterns is something that's very prevalent in the houses in the area uh, in, in Santurce and many other areas in San Juan and the rest of the island. And actually there was another floor with uh, another floor tile pattern in one of the other areas of the exhibition that was based on the pattern of the tiles in my grandparents' uh, dining room. Because what, what happened with those houses is that each room in the house has a different pattern and very different colors. So, so it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a range of color patterns and uh, data, you know, information. And uh, so the project ended up being quite, ended up being quite personal for me. It, it allowed me to explore ideas of displacement and dislocation, which are so close to me as, you know, part of the Puerto Rican diaspora here in the US and also to think about architecture and geography and their relationship to memory. And I was thinking about the memories that might be embedded in the architecture somehow or on the land and, and my own memories and my ties to that location and, and that type of architecture. Because you know, it, it's, you're only seeing the basement, but the Spanish revival house that's above it is quite beautiful. Um, and it's, it's, it's the, the type of architectural style that's uh, that's that's very common in that area. So I was also exploring the idea of drawing as a three-dimensional space, you know, one one that we could experience and and move through it. And and drawing is very much part of my practice. I I, I also have a practice a, a drawing practice that's a lot more intimate, and and that people often don't even get to see because I usually end up exhibiting larger projects or site-specific projects. So these are, these are small, about 12 by eight and a half or nine inches. This is part of a series, it's called the Touch Receptor Series, and it's been ongoing for many years. And, you know, I produce these quite regularly. At some points, they even become part of a daily practice, uh, regardless of what other project I'm working on at the time. And the ones I'm showing you are all recent, though, from the past uh, three years or, or so since the pandemic started. And part of what I do through them is experiment with marks in a way that's more intuitive than, than how I work with many of my other projects. But they're also a way to explore concepts and ideas. And here I was, you know, this was pandemic 
height of the pandemic. So I was exploring things like contamination and disruption and, and the concept of collapse. The thing is that as I continued to work on them, I kept imagining some of these marks just moving and breaking apart. Uh, you know, I, I, it got to the point where I felt I needed to animate them. Um, I wanted them to become more active and see where that would take me, formally, but also conceptually. And so that led to a couple of new animation projects and, and video projects, which have allowed me to continue exploring concepts that I was you know, originally thinking about through the drawings, but explore them through movement and sound as well. So what you see here is a, uh, an installation from 2021. It's titled Rupturing, and it's a three-channel animated video installation with floating screens that can be viewed from both sides. The point of installing the screens this way is so that we could walk into the center of the installation and be surrounded by it, but we could also step out of it or even walk around the individual screens. I, I actually, no, no, no screen was parallel or perpendicular to a wall. So I also wanted that, that diagonal shift, not, not make a relationship to architecture this time. Um, and I'm gonna play about three minutes of it. Just be aware that what I'm gonna show, it's a demo with the three channels, one next to the other. So it's not how it's meant to be, but I, I want to give you an idea.
And I'll stop it there. <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I feel that what started as an exploration into concepts of disruption and collapse in terms of mark making led me to a deeper, you know, to deeper considerations of or into collapsing systems, um, whether those are political, economic, environmental, um, you know, just, just to name a few. It also made me think of the possibility of transformation and about things that may need to be disrupted or you know, that need to collapse in order to be transformed. So, so you know, I, I think working with uh, movement and, and sound added to that uh, exploration that I was doing. So last year, I had the opportunity to show another animated video as a large scale outdoor projection here in Kalamazoo downtown. Uh, I think it's called the Haymarket Plaza. And through it, I continued to explore disruption and collapse, but um, I took advantage of the, of the format of, of how long the projection and, and the site was, and also played with ideas of falling and floating. So I, I took advantage. And instead of the more circular movement of the previous installation, this one took advantage of the vertical format. And, um, I'm currently working on a few new projects, including an animated video installation for a solo show I have in December at a nonprofit exhibition space back home called El Lobby. And the space uses the building's lobby or what used to be the building's lobby when it was originally um, built. Um, it, it, you know, I think that was in the 60s the building changed its configuration. So that lobby is not used as a lobby anymore and it became a commercial space, which is now this nonprofit's uh, exhibition space. So, you know, that's, that's why the, the name of the, of the space is uh, the English word lobby, but phonetically spelled in Spanish. And so, you know, I'm using the concept of the lobby for the show. Um, I'm titling it De Pasada y a Través which roughly translates as passing by and through. And this is not the best translation, but, but I, I think makes the point. I need to think about a better translation. Um, and so I'm exploring the lobby as a space that we enter and exit, not one where we stay. It's a space that one goes through in order to get to another place, a space of transition, you know, not here nor there. And so the new video will be projected onto floating screens, just as in the three channel installation that I showed earlier, which you can see them from both sides of the screen. And you know, this time I'm only working with two channels in reference to the entrance and the exit. You know, so I'm, I'm, I'm working in, in, you know, conceptually with the format in that way, or, or perhaps being in between two places. Um, which I feel directly ties to my experience, you know, part of the diaspora. So um, I'll play one section of the new video. The rest of the work is still in progress. I'm still editing, um, but this, this section is completed. I'll, I'll show only about 30 seconds of it. And it focuses on rip currents, which I'm sure many of you know are strong currents that quickly flow away from, from the beach into the open water. Uh, it has the potential of dragging people away from the shore. And so as a visual element, you'll see that I'm using a red color flag. It's sort of like the danger recurrent flag that uh, I, I shot and photographed back home uh, about a year ago. So let's, let's play that.
once again, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, and 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 the the yeah, the, I, I wanted to talk about some of the other, but I won't. Let's not. <laughs> I don't want to describe some of the other sections, but um, and I'm getting to the end here because I'm keeping track of time. But you know, I I know that I've shown quite a bit of work and very different kinds of projects that incorporate different approaches um, or or strategies and mapping as a conceptual strategy as well as uh, the use of abstraction are two strategies that I consistently use as part of my practice. Um, I feel they allow me, abstraction in particular, to explore things that I find hard to pinpoint or articulate. Um, to me, art making is about exploring concepts and emotions. Uh, and, and it's part of my process of trying to understand the world around me, you know, the, the world around me, what I feel, what's inside of me. It's, it's kind of my way of analyzing my, you know, my, my context. Um, I feel lucky that I've had the opportunity to exhibit my work and share my practice with other people. And that includes all of you. So thank you so much for being here. Um, And, and I'm, I'm more than happy to answer questions. <laughs> Bright lights. Um, so go for it. So you, you explore concepts that are very cerebral, but then you explore them through other <laughs> studies. Do, do you have a constant moving back through these ideas that you have, and then the implementation of them through an aesthetic process, or do you conceive of it in the beginning and then sort of like follow it, or is it very interactive? Could you let us know what the question was, because I couldn't hear it. Yes, thank you for that question. So you're pointing, and now I have to repeat it. <laughs> so um, you're, you're pointing to the fact that some of my work is quite cerebral, but I'm working on it through these aesthetic processes. And so you're asking whether, like, what comes first in a way, or is it? I mean, do you build feedback loops? Right. Feedback? I, I, really exploring these intellectual ideas through an aesthetic process. Right. Or do you have a, a concept that you just sort of, I mean, I, I'm really curious yes. about yes. artistic process. Yes. So, so, so the question is, do I, do I build a feedback? Um, is, is this an ongoing thing that continues to interconnect? Or is it a, a single concept that that I kind of linearly go through it as part of my exploration? I think both things happen, but there's always this feedback. You know, that I, I feel that it's sort of a, a little bit of an additive process because I think ultimately it all connects in various ways. Um, so, you know, at the moment where you know, perhaps I've, I've, I've been working a lot with navigation and, and ideas of dislocation. At the moment that I, through the COVID time, moved into ideas of um, disruption, collapse, and, and, and contamination, I felt how those three concepts also tied to ideas of dislocation and, and and aligned really well with the types of fragmentation that I that I tend to work with, or the way that I work with layers. So so yes, in some projects I may be exploring one particular concept, but I feel that there's always a feedback and there's always a dialogue with with previous works. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. <laughs> ah, then that means we need to have a conversation. <laughs> there was, yes? Hi. Um, you mentioned that you know, you're very curious about um, the, the space between factual and imaginary. And you also were talking about the Bermuda Triangle. I'm wondering if you uh, have looked at the, well, you also talked about 
the perspective of uh, environmental and um, biological and, and um, the cerebral. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if uh, you, if some of this could have come from millions and billions of years ago, and if you've ever explored the Pangea maps that are interactive that show our Earth and how the land masses have changed. And that particularly came to mind for me when you were showing the Bermuda Triangle mm -hmm. and the mysteries that you're, you're trying to, um, kind of like you said, you're, you're interested in um, the mysteries yeah. and how to solve those. And, and yeah, so, so the question is about um, you know, I'm, I'm using maps and I'm talking about, uh, particularly with the Bermuda Triangle maps, and I'm talking about or, or exploring some environmental concerns and other uh, um, uh, geologic concerns even. And so the question is, have I uh, done any research on Pangea and maybe incorporated that because, it, you know, this work made you think of it. And, and, and no, I haven't. Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> I just found out about the Pangea maps recently. Right. So, right, right. So, so of course I know what Pangea is, but um, but I've never, you know, uh, explored it in in any depth. But it it does make me think that th there is a there is a layering of time in, in my work and my research that I often don't talk about. And maybe that's because I haven't thought about it so much um, that, that that might be what you're picking up there as well. So thank you. Thanks for your question. Anyone else? I know that there was a hand back here. I, my hand was up, but you kind of answered. Okay, <laughs> which I guess I didn't fully answer, so I'm really curious about that. Yes. Do I do all of my own sound? That's a great question. So I do animate all of my work. Um, I do record all my sounds and I edit them. Um, I often send that edited sound to a sound designer so that he cleans it up. <laughs> uh, you know, like there, there are things that I need tweaking that, that is beyond my, my, my knowledge. And so that, that sometimes happens. Um, there, there was one, and, and I should say, cause when you, when you bring up the sound, you know, besides this daily practice of drawing, I'm, I'm also collecting on a daily basis, whether it's text that I read or if I hear a particular sound that I'm interested in, I record it right there on site, uh, or obviously I collect maps. So, so, so that collecting is also part of my practice. So that's when I, when I work with sound, I bring up that sort of archive, ongoing archive. Um, but there was for, for, the, um, for the three channel piece, I, I did have an issue with my sound where I needed a little bit more help. And it's because I was layering sounds of um, wind and you know other, other sounds that to me were sounding a little bit too realistic. And I was working with pure abstraction. So, so I felt that was placing us too much in a particular context. There were sounds of water and um, so, so I, I edited my sound and, and I sent it to, uh, to my sound designer and I said, okay, this is my edit, but I need you to abstract it a little bit more. And, and so we worked back and forth, uh, you know, a little bit just, just to do that. So there are, the, the, I, I didn't show that uh, part, but there's a, a part where these uh, forms that are reminiscent of islands are sort of expanding and flowing and changing. And so, yeah, there is a feeling of like, there's talk about Pangea. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a reference to water in that sound, but yeah, it's not the crashing waves that I originally had in there. So it's more of a rhythm and a suggestion, but, but 
But yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Yes. I've got another question. Uh, your, your work obviously brings you joy because you are just beaming every moment that you're talking mm -hmm. about. But are there times when, when it brings you pain or angst? <laughs> of course. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And and there was actually a, a a project that I that I was originally gonna show that I didn't. Um and 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 it was something I produced after Hurricane Maria, uh you know, devastated. Puerto Rico, um, among other islands. And, um, you know, at that point we had to bring my parents, my elderly parents over. They were here temporarily um, for about a year in the States before we could send them back. And so the, the, the issue I had and the struggle and the pain that I had besides the emotional pain of the actual hurricane and the devastation was related to since I wasn't there and I physically did not go through the hurricane, do I have the right to generate artwork about it? And, and so uh, that, that would be one example. And, and I ended up doing something quite, uh, quite data related and, and map related, but not with an actual map. It was mostly through data and, and you know, months after I finished it, it, it came to me, yeah, sure, that I feel comfortable with that. And that sort of shows my experience of the hurricane, you know, which was tracking it from a distance, you know, tracking it, not, 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 exp not feeling it through my senses, but tracking it from a distance. And so, yeah, would that, res yeah, would that respond to your question? Thank you. I bet a lot of people are going to have questions while you're out with the refreshments. I was just going to say, I'm happy to chat out there, and I look forward to it. Thank you so much.